Welcome to Worship with St. Andrew's United Church in North Bay. We are so pleased that you have chosen to join with us, and we hope that you will be welcomed and feel that this time is a blessing to you. This is Sunday, May 2nd, the fifth Sunday in the season of Easter, and today we are exploring the sense of the image of Jesus as the vine and the church as the branches. There are a number of announcements that I want to bring attention to this morning. And uh, first of all, to say that May 5th, 2013, this congregation became an affirming congregation of the United Church of Canada. And in June, when it is Pride Sunday, we'll have an opportunity to celebrate that more. But I did want to mention that this is a special weekend for the congregation as we remember that commitment and that history, and as we think about how we live that into the future. You will notice if you have looked at the bulletin for today's worship that this is also the beginning of Mental Health Awareness Week and that the United Church has taken this on, and particularly uh, the cluster of United Churches in the North Bay area, have committed to seeing mental health as a priority for conversations and education within our churches. And so I hope that you will take a look at the Together newsletter and see the opportunities for joining in a series of webinars that the United Church of Canada is joining. And also to read the ways in which each of us can be more conscious in our own lives of how we pay attention to our own mental health and the mental health of others. We all know that during this pandemic time, many people are struggling with a sense of well-being. Next Sunday is for many families, Mother's Day, and also traditionally within the church, Christian Family Sunday. And so the United Church of Canada has launched a way of celebrating that that invites us to be conscious of families that struggle and how our support is so important for them. That support that comes through the programs of our mission and service fund. And so I, again, point you to the Together newsletter and invite you to look at the ways that you can participate in supporting other families during that day of celebration. And lastly, next Friday, May 7th, is the first of our transition conversations that are happening by Zoom. And you're going to find all the information about how you connect with that in the Together newsletter. This is a time where we hope people will come and just share some of their dreams for the congregation, some of the ways that you see the congregation moving forward, as well as some of your concerns and anxieties about how the congregation can live into its future. Your presence is welcomed, and we hope that you will take advantage of this opportunity to lend your voice to how this congregation moves forward. In an offering of respect and honor, we acknowledge that we meet on the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe Nipissing First Nation. We acknowledge their care and stewardship of the land as a gift, and we offer ourselves to the ongoing work of truth and reconciliation and to finding a path toward right relations. During the season of Easter, we have been lighting what we have named the resurrection candle. The candle that reminds us of the new life that shines through the risen Christ. Today we light it remembering that that life is something that is shared with us as we abide in Christ and Christ abides in us. May this light grant us peace and comfort, love, and wisdom. I invite you to join with me in the call to worship. Come and abide in the one who is our life. Like a branch needing to be nourished, seek the love that flows through the vine, connecting all to the one who is love and to one another. As branches of the same vine, we join in worship and offer our praise. 
we join our hearts and our words as we offer ourselves in prayer before God. Join with me. God of love, who tends the garden of life, root us deep in the rich soil of your grace. Help us to grow and flourish as branches of discipleship on Christ's vine. Let your love flow through us, connecting us in common purpose and encouraging the fruit of our lives to bring forth gifts of encouragement and beauty. Abide in us, that we may be drawn to abide in you and to bear that love from one another in the world. We pray this in your name, and we offer the words that you have taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day and our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our opening hymn this morning is, Many are the Light Beams. Many of the stories that I've been telling from Scripture have come from the Old Testament, but today's story comes to us from the book of Acts in the New Testament. The book of Acts is about the early church, and this is the story of one of the disciples, one of the apostles called Philip. Much of Acts talks about the work of Paul, but this story is a turning point in the life of the early church. Philip has just been on a very successful mission in Samaria, where many have come to believe in Jesus and have been baptized. And so he's kind of wondering, where do I go next? And God sends an angel and says to Philip, well, I want you to go on this rather desolate road that leads from Jerusalem down to Gaza. Philip listens. And he finds himself on that lonely road. And as he looks, he sees that there's a chariot approaching. And in the chariot, obviously, a person who is from Ethiopia. He looks closer, and he can see all of the signs that this person is obviously part of the court of Queen Candace, that he has some kind of position of authority. Ah, he's the treasurer. 
But there are other telltale signs about this traveler. Signs that tell Philip that he is a eunuch. Someone whose sexual identity has been defined because he serves the queen and all of her harem. He is in many ways an outsider, the ultimate outsider, this fellow in the chariot. He obviously does not look Jewish, so why has he been to Jerusalem and seeking spiritual connection at the temple? He obviously is reading something, and as Philip tries to strain to listen, he hears words that he thinks belong to the prophet Isaiah. It would not be all that unusual for a person who had some resources to own a scroll. Or maybe this fellow only had a portion of the book and was reading from the prophet. But the voice of the angel comes to Philip again and says, now get yourself inside that chariot. Have a conversation with the fellow. So Philip picks up his pace and begins to almost jog toward the chariot. And as he gets closer and closer, he can hear the words that the Ethiopian is reading. Indeed, they are words from the prophet Isaiah. Like a sheep, he is led to the slaughter. Like a lamb, he is silent. Philip wonders if this person has any idea what he is reading. And so when he finally gets close enough to the chariot, he says, do you know, do you understand the words that you have been reading? And the Ethiopian eunuch looks at Philip and says, how could I understand? I need someone to explain it to me. The chariot slows. And Philip climbs up in with the Ethiopian, and together they talk. Philip uses the words from Isaiah to speak of Jesus, his life, his teaching, his death, his resurrection, to speak of those who are seeking to follow his way into the future, and how baptism is the way in which they are welcomed into that community. Can you imagine this poor Ethiopian eunuch really in many ways not belonging anywhere? He didn't belong on the road to Jerusalem, Gaza. That wasn't his geography. His race and ethnicity, they didn't belong with the Jewish community. His expression of sexuality, that put him outside of all kinds of communities and religious practice. And yet he was seeking to belong, to have a place where he had spiritual connection. As they continue down the road, it's the Ethiopian who sees the water and says to Philip, is there any reason I can't be baptized? And he has the chariot stop. And Philip and the Ethiopian climb out, they go down to the water, and Philip baptizes the Ethiopian. And then, as the story goes in the book of Acts, Philip is gone, vanished, and the Ethiopian never sees him again. But there is a sense that the Ethiopian has gained a sense of connection, of belonging, of knowing that he is welcomed into a community whose inclusivity is shaped by love. For some, this is the story of the first baptism outside of the known community, the first Gentile. For some, this is a story of radical welcome and inclusivity. For some, it's a story about the power of baptism 
to bring people to a relationship with Jesus. It's probably all of those things. And on this weekend, when this congregation celebrates its inclusivity, is a story that invites us to think about who we stop to listen to, who we invite to be part of the conversation, who are those with whom we share the community of Christ. The reading today is from John 15, verses 1 to 8, The Vine and the Branches. I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. These words are offered as wisdom for our journey. Let us walk together in their truth. I invite you to pray with me. Holy Spirit, flow through us with the sap of your love, that we may hear words to both encourage and challenge us, and that we might know your presence in our hearts and minds. Amen. So this is the time of year, if you're an avid gardener, you're already out there playing in the soil. And even if you're not a gardener yourself, you can't help but notice the signs of gardeners having been at work. Soil that's been turned over, branches at the end of the driveway that are waiting to be picked up. And in a few weeks, those seedlings that we will see freshly planted. So it's not so hard for us to imagine this image of God as the divine gardener, the vine dresser, the one who tends the vine and the branches. In the passage of scripture from John's Gospel that Pat read for us this morning, we hear this wonderful imagery of Jesus as the vine and the church, the disciples, as the branches. It's an image of the church that has sustained for generations, one that's depicted for us in this wonderful McNutt window that is in the chapel of St. Andrews. Of course, we in Northern Ontario are maybe geographically challenged a little to grow vines of grapes, but we certainly are not challenged to grow a sturdy tree with many branches. And this particular depiction of Jesus as the vine and the church as the branches holds for us this image of the great trunk of life with all of the branches outstretched as a canopy holding creation under its shade. It's also a reminder that we are connected with those who have walked before us, that we share this connection with those who have borne the fruit of faith in our community, like the McNutts. I don't know what you think of when you think of a vine of grapes, but I don't tend to think of something that's overly large. I think of the wine tours that I've been on in the Niagara Peninsula or the Okanagan Valley of BC, and they seem pretty in control. But this is a very different image that I'm going to have you see. It's the image of the oldest and the largest living vine. It's actually at the Hampton Court Garden in England. This vine of grapes is over 230 years old. 
and the vine at its base now measures over 12 feet. And the longest branch on that vine is 129 feet long. That changes my perspective a little bit about what it means to be called the branches of the vine. If we look at the canopy that they provide over the greenhouse, we see that they are thriving and growing. And this very old vine still bears an abundance of fruit. So much so that the public is invited each September to come and help harvest all of the grapes that are found. Wouldn't it be wonderful if that's how we saw ourselves as church? Growing, vital, alive, able to produce much fruit in the world. In some ways, this is the image that Jesus is holding out for his disciples. This reading is part of what is called the discourse, the farewell discourse from John's Gospel. Jesus is trying to prepare his disciples for the time when he will no longer be with them. And what does he say to them? He says, I'm like the vine. I'm going to be always with you. My love will continue to nourish to invite you to grow, to allow you to bear fruit in the world. I will abide in you and you will abide in me. And you know that early church needed those kinds of words of encour encouragement because they were trying to figure out exactly what kind of community of faith they would be. By the time is John is committing these words to paper, the early church has already been ousted from the synagogue. And so they are trying to sort out how it is that they will carry the traditions of the past forward into this new community that they know Christ is asking them to shape in a new way. What is important of what has been part of the past? What food laws will they carry forward? What signs of the covenants will be a part of their own tradition? How will they welcome new members? I hope those questions resonate with the folks of St. Andrews because those are the very questions that we need to wrestle with in these times of transition. What are the things of the past that continue to nurture us, to allow us to grow? to abide in the connection with Christ who is the source of our life and our love? How do we bear fruit in the community in which we stand? We often think of this time and the way in which churches are changing. Or maybe if we were more truthful, we would say the ways in which the world around the church are changing. It's clear in this pandemic, microscopic moment of time that there is much change. If you had been doing strategic planning just two years ago, could you have imagined that the number one thing on that list would be learning to do online worship as a way of staying connected? But here we are. It's a fundamental practice of how we are church in this time. In some ways, those shifts, those changes, as difficult as they are, are also like a pruning that maybe allows us to discover new life in a way that we never would have imagined on our own. Being connected is central to this gospel passage. Connected both to the vine that is a source of our life connected to one another as branches in the community, and through our fruit that we bear, connected to the world around us. You see, the source of a community's life is found in the love that nourishes it. And above all, Jesus wants his disciples to know that that love 
will always be with them. Whatever happens, the love of God continues to flow through their lives. And as we seek to become healthy and productive community, that's part of our journey too. How do we remember that God's love flows through us? There's a little story that I suspect many of you have heard. It's called the Rabbi's Gift. And it really begins with this image of a monastery that has become rather run down. There isn't much activity there anymore. People don't flock to the door to worship. There isn't a lot of outreach going on because the monks have become too old to tend the gardens that they used to take into town to feed the people. There's just a depletion of energy and purpose. It's as if the monastery and the monks themselves are just waiting to die. But in the woods by the monastery, there is, in an old hut, a rabbi. And the abbot of the monastery and the rabbi are actually friends. And so one night, the abbot goes to the rabbi, and together they cry about the state of the world and the state of the monastery. And the rabbi says to the abbot, you no longer have joy in what you are doing. The burden is weighing down everyone. So I'm going to tell you one secret. I want you to go back to the monastery and you can only speak this once, but this is what you must speak. The Christ is among you. And so the abbot went back to the monastery the next morning after morning prayers. He gathered the monks and he said, I can only tell you this once, but what I want to tell you is that the Christ, the Messiah, is among us. The old monks all of a sudden looked at each other differently. They began to see which one among them might be that loving presence. They found new energy in relating to each other and a new sense that surely if the Christ was among them, then they must be about the work of Christ. And slowly, the monastery transformed. The gardens became alive again, and the monks took food into town. And with that connection, the town people came to worship. And there was even an emerging of some young people who asked about life at the monastery. You see, the gift that the rabbi had given was the gift of connection, of being connected to the love of God in our presence, the one who invites us to witness and become the church that bears fruit. We can't bear fruit on our own. We need to be nourished from the vine and we need to be gathered in this community of branches that are intertwined and interconnected, but protect and nourish each other. So I wonder, what would it look like to bear the fruit of discipleship? For those of you that maybe are more familiar with scripture, your minds might already be racing ahead to a familiar piece in Galatians 5, where we are told what the fruits of the Spirit are, those wonderful gifts of love and joy and peace, patience, kindness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And those certainly are gifts that as people of faith we experience and are given as we become closely connected to the one who is the source of our being and our life. But as church, we are also called to bear a different kind of fruit. Fruit that the world can partake and be nourished by. Fruit that bears the seeds of justice in the world. Fruit that knows how to feed those who are hungry. 
fruit that speaks of the sweetness of life. Fruit that can be used in as many ways as the human imagination can begin to picture. Fine wine, grape juice, oils, vinegar, raisins, all of those fruits. A tree does not bear fruit for its own sake. It bears fruit as a gift to others. Some of you may have seen on the Facebook page of the congregation or the Facebook page of Loaves and Fishes in the last 10 days, a picture of a single toonie. The toonie has a story. And the story is that one of the clients who comes to the Loaves and Fishes program outreach was so moved that they left this offering for the restoration project of the congregation. That toonie is a parable. It's a witness to what happens when we bear the fruit of Christ's love in the world. People begin to be touched by that love. We are proud here at St. Andrews of our loaves and fishes outreach, of the ways that we are able to meet a few of the needs in our community. But this parable of the loony reminds us that we are equally as blessed by the fruit that is born in the lives of those whom we touch. This gift says that as we share the fruit of our love, not just in ways that feed the body, but we hope in ways through respect feed the souls of those who come. Life is transformed and fruit is born. I pray for St. Andrews that we might learn to grow as branches of the vine, that we might discover deeper connections with the source of our life and our faith, our hope, the love that overflows. That we might learn how we can connect in ways that support and uphold one another as we learn and are able to bear fruit in the world. And that we might be nourished so that we can bear the fruit of love for others. May we learn to live as that kind of community. May we learn to be those who bear the fruit of Christ in our world. May it be so. Thanks be to God.
The sharing of the fruit of our lives is a call to be disciples in the world. And so I want to thank you for the many ways in which you share the fruit of your living with others. Whether through that is acts of kindness, whether it's sharing of resources, whether it is a way in which you help build a world more just and caring. For those who support the work and life of this congregation, thank you for the many ways that you do that, whether it's through pre-authorized remittance or Sunday envelopes that are dropped in the mail slot or checks that arrive in the mail or our donate button in Canada Helps. All of those help us to sustain our ministry and the presence of this congregation into the future. So we bring the gifts of our living, the fruit of our hands and our lives, to offer to God. Let us offer these words of dedication. God in whom we are rooted, Christ in whom we grow, loving spirit through whom we bear fruit for one another, receive the gifts that are the fruit of our living, bless them, and allow that they may nurture others with life. Amen. Good morning. Let us pray. God of grapevines and creeping ivy, hydrangea vine and morning glory, we thank you this morning for plants that climb. We thank you for their teachings. They cling to brick and stone or twirl around sticks and trellises, reaching for the light. They are determined and grow strong. When they are cut back, they rest a while and come back stronger than before, reaching for the light. So may we grow, gardener God, stronger every day as we reach for light and truth and love. God of robins and chickadees, white-throated sparrows and calling loons, we thank you this morning for birds that sing. We thank you for their teachings. They greet the morning with song, joyously describing the nests they have built, the love they will offer, the little bugs and fat worms they will bring their children. When there is a cold rain, they rest a while, and then sing on, louder and more joyous than before, reaching for celebration. So may we sing, God of songbirds, stronger every day as we reach for joy and connection and love. God of legends, God of myth and story and parable, we especially thank you this morning for hummingbirds. In British Columbia, Nesconleth Chief Judy Wilson honors hummingbirds for their great loyalty to the forest, their home. She tells the story of a forest fire when all other animals fled, but hummingbirds stayed, carrying drops of water in their tiny beak from the river to the fire. In response to the other animals, hummingbirds said, I'm doing what I can. God of all life, we thank you this morning for the teachings of the hummingbird. When our faith community, or our city, or our beautiful planet is ablaze with fear, fear of pandemic, 
of rising carbon or simply change. Help us to carry the water of compassion and courage, even a drop at a time, so that we can say with love to one another, I'm doing what I can. Amen. The spring has come, let all the church be part of it. The world has changed and God is at the heart of it. New light, new day, new color after winter break. New light, new day, the spring has come, let all the church be part of it. The sun is warm, let all the children play in it. The world expands, let's spread the gospel way in it. New leaf, new thrust, new greeting for the love of Christ. New leaf, new thrust, the sun is warm, let all the children play in it. The spring has come, new people are the flowers of it. Through wind and rain, new life is in the showers of it. New bud, new shoot, new hope will bear the Spirit's fruit. New bud, new shoot, the spring has come, new people are the flowers of it. The spring has come, let all the church be part of it. The world has changed and God is at the heart of it. New light. My name is Kathy Coleman, and I sit on the transition team here at St. Andrews. We are trying to discern just what it means to be St. Andrews. What are the hard questions we need to ask ourselves? Normally, we would be meeting with small groups over coffee in the parlor to hear your thoughts, but a lot of things aren't normal right now. Still, we want a chance to hear from as many people as possible to help us with our goals. So, we would like to invite everyone to lunchtime Zoom drop-in sessions. These will be held from 12.15 to 1 p.m. each Friday throughout May. We'll post the question of the week in the weekly news sheet to get you thinking. We'll also post the link and other information you need to connect with us. So grab your lunch, your coffee, and join us on Zoom every Friday in May from 12.15 to 1 p.m for what we hope to be a lively drop-in discussion group. We are really looking forward to hearing what you have to say. As we prepare to uh, leave this time of worship, I just want to remind you that if you were wanting to know more about what is happening in the life of St. Andrew's congregation, if you want to feel more connected, that the way to do that is through our Together Online newsletter that appears on our webpage each week. You can subscribe uh, to that newsletter by using the subscription button that appears when you click on the link that talks about the Together newsletter. So we hope that you will stay informed about the life and work of this congregation and the many activities that are also part of the ministry of the wider United Church of Canada. So as we leave this place, we leave to go into the world and bear the fruit of God's love for others. We are challenged to grow, to be alive, to be vital and productive disciples that others might come to know the love that sustains our living. So may God, who is the gardener, the vine grower, tend you and make you fruitful. May Christ abide in you and give you life. And may the Holy Spirit flow through you, casting away any fear, allowing you to bring forth that which can feed others in his name. Amen. <laughs>